solids of ionic compounds are very brittle. Um, take a, you know, a piece of rock salt, hit it with a hammer and see what happens. Okay, they're very brittle, which means that when you try to hammer them, they shatter. Now the reason this happens is because all of the ions in the ionic compound are connected to each other. So I'm going to draw a really crude picture here, okay? So I've got positive ion and then I've got a negative ion and a negative ion here and a positive ion here and a positive ion here, and a negative ion here, positive here, negative here, positive here. Okay guys, now if I take a hammer and I whack this, okay? So let's draw in our hammer. Whee! I'm using a big oversized sledgehammer. So if I whack this with the sledgehammer, what it does is it shifts the ions. So all of a sudden, I now have a positive ion sitting next to a positive ion and a negative ion sitting next to a negative ion. Light charges repel. So this sucker shatters along that line because I've shifted the ions physically and I brought ions that are light charges next to each other and they repel. So that's why ionic compounds are brittle. Okay? So we're done with ionic compounds and we're ready to move on to covalent compounds. Now, remember in covalent bonding, we have the sharing of electrons. And we see covalent bonding between non-metal atoms. Okay? So when we look at a very simple ion like the, well, it's very simple, covalent molecule. Okay, this one's not a compound. This is just a covalent molecule of hydrogen. Then we have two hydrogen atoms, each with one electron. And when they bond, each hydrogen brings one electron and they share them. And so those electrons act as a bridge between those two hydrogens. And those two hydrogens are now connected just to each other. So a covalent bonding is the sharing of electrons. Okay? Now, in this situation, we can see they both have shared the one electron. Now, let's look at water. And we'll draw it for you. Here's a pictorial representation of water. Okay, we'll start off with an oxygen atom. And there's its six valence electrons, okay? And here's a hydrogen atom with its one electron and a hydrogen atom with its one electron. This oxygen then has made a bond with this hydrogen and here are the electrons that are being shared between the two and over here it's being shared. So sometimes we'll draw it like this. Okay, the line represents the shared electrons. So this oxygen is involved in two covalent bonds with two different hydrogen atoms. Okay, a single atom, depending on what it is, could make more than one connection with other atoms. So this oxygen has made connections with two other atoms. Okay? Now, Let's talk about some terms here that we're going to use when we talk about covalent bonding. We're going to talk about a bond pair. It's a pair of electrons being shared between two atoms. A lone pair is a non-bonding pair of atoms. It's a pair of electrons on an atom, in an atom's valence that aren't involved in bonding. So if we look over here at our water molecule, okay? This is a bond pair. This is a bond pair. This is a lone pair. And this is a 
lone pair. So the oxygen has two bond pairs, two lone pairs. Each hydrogen has one bond pair. Okay, remember hydrogen's valence shell, its outermost shell is the first shell. The first shell only has one subshell, which has one orbital. It can only hold two electrons. So all hydrogen ever wants to see is one bond pair. Okay. Now, uh, let's talk about diatomic elements for a minute. When we see pure hydrogen, nitrogen, fluorine, oxygen, bromine, iodine, or chlorine, they appear or they occur in nature as diatomic molecules. So you won't find a single fluorine atom floating around in nature. If you find pure fluorine, it's always an F subscript 2. Or a nitrogen is always N2. You don't breathe in a single nitrogen atom. You breathe in nitrogen molecules. Okay? Now, in some situations, atoms can share more than one pair of electrons. When atoms... When two atoms share one pair of electrons, we call it a single bond. Okay? When atoms scroll up for me just a hair. When atoms share two pairs of electrons, we call it a double bond. Now there's limited atoms that can double bond. Oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus, silicon, and sulfur double bond on a regular basis. Okay? There are some other atoms that in extreme circumstances will double bond, but these are the ones that do it easily, okay? And when two atoms share three pairs of electrons, it's called a triple bond. The only two atoms that triple bond are carbon and nitrogen. Now let me draw you some pretty pictures, okay? Kind of show you what to look for if you see a picture to represent a double bond, a triple bond. So if we look at just oxygen, O2, and we were to pictorially represent oxygen, okay? The two lines between the oxygen represent a double bond. Nitrogen, N2, We see three lines, that represents a triple bond. If I were to draw something that looks like this, okay, this carbon involved, is involved in the triple bond with another carbon, and it's involved with a single bond with the hydrogen. If we were to draw something like this, Okay, this carbon is involved in two single bonds with hydrogens and a double bond with an oxygen. So lines are gonna represent our bonds between two atoms. A line represents a shared pair of electrons. Two lines is a double bond. Three lines is a triple bond. And one line is a single bond. Okay? Now, Covalent bonding leads to the formation of molecules. And molecules are discrete entities. They have edges. Okay? So the bonding goes in inside, and there's a stop point where that molecule ends. This is different than the ionic compounds where the ionic bond extends through a whole solid sample. If I have a solid covalent compound, I have discrete molecules that are then going to be attracted to each other by a different interaction called an intermolecular force. So the physical properties of a covalent compound depend on how the molecules in with, interact with each other and not the strength of the covalent bond inside the molecule. So the range of melting points and boiling points and behaviors of the covalent compounds are quite different than those of the ionic compounds. Covalent compounds have a tendency to have lower boiling points, lower melting points than ionic compounds. 
They don't consist in the solid or the liquid base, and um, for the most part, they don't conduct when they're dissolved in water. Okay, we'll talk about a special group of compounds called acids. They behave a little differently. Um, and they can be anywhere from soft to very brittle. So let's look at naming covalent compounds. Now, when you take organic chemistry, if you take organic chemistry, you're gonna learn a whole classification for naming carbon-based compounds that contain carbon and hydrogen. We're gonna study right now just naming simple two element compounds, okay? They're called binary. Bi for two. Binary means two element covalent compounds. Now, the secret to naming covalent, well, naming covalent compounds is going to look a little different than naming ionic compounds because I can take the same two elements and form different covalent molecules with differing ratios of the two elements. Like CO, CO2, N2, O4, NO, NO2, okay? I can have different ratios. So when I'm naming covalent compounds, we've got to use prefixes. So let's look at the pattern of naming uh, covalent compounds, okay? So keep scrolling. So we're going to use a prefix, name of the first element, prefix, name of the second element, okay? the base name with an IDE ending. And we're gonna use the same prefixes that we were using for hydrates. Mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, deca. So let's look at some examples of how we're gonna name this. Okay, let's head to the board. <clears throat> now, let's start out with CO and CO2 because these are ones you're familiar with. They're kind of in the common vernacular. We'll have carbon and oxygen, so we call this carbon monoxide. Now, you could put a carbon out here, a mono in front of the carbon, but when there's only one of the first element, we drop the mono. And notice with oxide and mono, the prefix mono has an O in it, and oxide starts with an O, we don't double the O up. One of the O's is dropped, okay? So this would be carbon dioxide. So the name tells you how many, okay? Now, let's see. We look at these two compounds that contain nitrogen and oxygen. I have two nitrogens here, so it's dinitrogen, five oxygens, penta oxide. Now remember, we change the ending of the last element in the name of the compound because I want to indicate a compound, not a mixture of elements. So this one would be nitrogen dioxide. Okay. So dinitrogen pentaoxide, nitrogen dioxide. Uh, let me see, let me pick out some more for us to practice with here. Um, well, here. Think about this one for a minute. You know it commonly is water, but we can systematically name it as a binary covalent compound. It would be dihydrogen mono oxide. So dihydrogen monoxide. <clears throat> so don't let anybody fool you with that one. That is a simple binary covalent compound. So let's try P4 
H4O10. Well, that's phosphorus, and 4 is tetra. So we have tetraphosphorus, and then deca oxide. Tetraphosphorus, deca oxide. Now, going back the other way is pretty straightforward. So, let's see. Um, if I had sulfur dioxide, I've got one of the sulfurs. The di means two, I've got two of the oxygens, SO2. If we had nitrogen, triiodide. Again, there's a double I, we only use one. So nitrogen triiodide is in I3. Not bad, okay? So those should be hopefully fairly straightforward for you. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. All right, now, the last thing that we need to talk about here in covalent compounds when it comes to naming is dealing with a special class of covalent compounds called acids, okay? Acids are covalent compounds that when dissolved in water, react with the water to produce an ion called the hydronium ion. Because of this behavior, acids are named based on the anion they release during the reaction. And we're gonna find two names for acids. Acids that are in their pure form, undissolved in water, and acids in their dissolved form. Okay, now here, let me show you. Okay, we're going to recognize an acid because hydrogen is going to appear first in the, in the formula. HCl, HNO3, HBr, um, HF, H2SO4. Okay, all of these have hydrogens listed first in their name. These are all acids. If I had something like NH3, CH4, um, PH3, these are not acids. They're covalent compounds, but they're not acids. Okay? Acids. Now, let's look at what an acid does when it reacts with water. HCl aqueous. Aqueous means dissolved in water. Actually is going to react with water. The plus sign means it's going to combine somehow. And it's going to give me a hydronium ion, which is dissolved in water, and a chloride ion, which is dissolved in water. Now next semester, we're going to spend two chapters dealing with these. So don't sweat it too much now. I don't expect you to be able to reproduce this chemical equation, okay? We haven't talked a whole lot about chemical equations yet, so don't panic. I'm just wanting you to see that when it dissolves up in water, it reacts and it releases an anion from a compound that didn't have any anions in it to begin with, okay? Now, so that salt, uh, acids are gonna be named more like salts. So if I have HCl, if I had all of these in the gas phase, so that they would be pure, okay? I'm going to name them as if they're salt, and the hydrogen is my cation, and whatever is not the hydrogen is our anion. So HF would be hydrogen fluoride. HCl would be hydrogen chloride. 
HNO3, hydrogen nitride, no, tri nitrate, that's a polyatomic. HBr would be hydrogen bromide. And H2SO4 is hydrogen sulfate. Named as if they're pure form. Now, I'm going to use kind of chlorine based acids as my poster child here. So HCl, HClO, HClO2, HClO3, HClO4. Okay, and I'm going to put pure here and aqueous, dissolved in water. Well, HCl pure, I've just named, pure, I've named for you, hydrogen chloride. Okay, HClO would be hydrogen hypo. Chloride. ITE ending a hypo prefix. Next one, HClO2 is hydrogen chloride, no hypo, and then hydrogen chlorate. ATE when HClO3 and then hydrogen per chlorate. Okay? Now, their name when they're aqueous depends on the ending of the anion. If it ends in IVE, okay? Then we use hydro and then chlor, ic, and then the word acid. If it ends in ITE, we don't use hydro. We start out with chlor and we use a suffix of us, acid. We change the ick to us. And we're going to put the hypo here. Because it's hypochlorite ion, hypochlorous is acid. This one doesn't have the hypo, so this is just going to be chlorous acid. Okay? This one is got an ATE ending. So we're going to go chlor, ick, acid. Okay? And this one has the per and the eight. So this would be per chloric acid. So if we've got an IVE ending, We're going to have hypo, I mean hydro, the base name of the anion, ic acid. If we have an ITE ending, we're going to have us acid, okay, and use prefixes, we're seeing. And then if it has an ATE ending, it's just going to be ic acid. And again, use prefixes where seen. Okay? So, 
Let me give you a couple of acids and we're going to name them. So if I had HBr aqueous, this would be hydrobromic acid. If I have HNO3 aqueous, this would be nitric acid. If I have H2SO4 aqueous, this is sulfuric acid. Okay? If I have H2S aqueous, this is hydrosulfuric. And believe me, you don't want to get these two acids mixed up. They have very different behaviors. And I wouldn't want to get them mixed up. So you got to pay attention. Okay, if I have H2SO3 aqueous, this would be sulfurous acid. Again, three different beasts. Okay? So that's naming acids. And guys, that is the end of naming. So hopefully you're feeling okay. All right. Now the last thing to deal with here in chapter four is to talk about metallic bonding. Metallic bonding is a pooling of valence electrons. The atoms share all of their valence electrons in and amongst all of the atoms in the solid and liquid phase. Now this is because metal atoms are pretty big and so they don't have a real good grip on their outer electrons. Because they don't have a really strong grip on their outer electrons, those outer electrons in the outermost shell are, are able in the solid and the liquid phase to move in and amongst all of the metal atoms in the sample. Okay? Now, this type of bonding okay, is what holds the metal together in its liquid phase and its, in its solid phase. And that means that I can put different metal atoms together in different ratios and still see metallic bonding. That's why combinations of metal atoms are called alloys, not compounds is because they don't have a fixed ratio by mass, okay? So they're kind of like a bonded mixture. So they're weird. Uh, the properties of metals are that they have lower melting points, but they have very high boiling points because to boil, you actually have to have, to jump into the gas phase, each metal atom has to collect up their own individual electrons and jump ship. They conduct in the solid phase and they conduct in the liquid phase and metals are workable. Okay guys, that ends chapter four.